Hello, class. All right, our last chapter in the circuit, chapter 12, Moving Still, page 113. For days, when I got home from school, I found Papa laying flat and complaining about not being able to pick cotton because his back was killing him. He often talked about leaving Corcoran and going back to Santa Maria, but he kept changing his mind, hoping to get better. He constantly worried that we would not have enough money saved at the end of the cotton season to carry us over the winter months. It was already the end of December and Roberto, my older brother, was the only one working. Mama stayed home to take care of Papa, Rora, and Ruben. My other two younger brothers, Torito and Trampita, went to school with me, and on weekends, when it did not rain, we went to work with Roberto. The only cotton left for us to harvest was la bola, the leftovers from the first picking, which paid one and a half cents per pound. But one day when I got home, Papa did not complain about anything, not even his back. As soon as I entered the cabin, he strained to straighten up from the mattress that lay on the floor and exclaimed, Mijo, are you all right? Si, sí, Papa, I responded, wondering why he looked so worried. Gracias a Dio, he said. La migra swept through the camp about an hour ago, and I didn't know if the immigration officers searched your school, too. Mama must have noticed the fright in my eyes when I heard the word migra because she immediately came and hugged me. That word evoked fear ever since the immigration raid in Tent City, a labor camp in Santa Maria, where we sometimes lived. It was a Saturday late afternoon. I was playing marbles with Trampita in front of our tent when I heard someone holler, La migra! La migra! I looked over my shoulder and saw several vans screech to a halt, blocking the entrance to the camp. The van's doors flew open. Out dashed armed men dressed in green uniforms. They invaded the camp, moving through the tents, searching for undocumented workers who ran into the wilderness behind the camp, trying to escape. L many, like Doña Maria La Curandera, were caught, herded, and hauled away in the border patrol vehicles. A few managed to get away. We were lucky. Mama and Roberto had gone to town to buy groceries. Papa showed the officers his green card that Ito had helped him get, and they did not ask about Trampita or me. When Roberto came home from work that evening, Papa and Mama were relieved to see him. You didn't see La Migra? Papa asked. It came to our camp but missed us, Mama said, rubbing her hands together. It didn't come to the field, Roberto responded. So you didn't go out with La Migra? Papa said jokingly, trying to ease the tension. Roberto went along with Papa's joke. No, Papa, she's not my type, he answered. We all laughed nervously. When Papa stopped laughing and bit his lower lip, I knew what was coming. You have to be careful, he warned us, waving his index finger at Roberto and me. You can't tell a soul you were born in Mexico. You can't trust anyone, not even your best friends. If they knew, they can turn you in. I had heard these words many times. I had memorized them. Now, where were you born, Panchito? He asked in a firm tone, giving me a piercing look. Colton, California, I answered. Good. Mijo, he said. Roberto then handed Papa the money he had earned that day. Papa clenched his fist, looking away toward the wall, and said, I am useless. I can't work. I can't feed my family. I can't even protect you from La Migra. Don't say that, Papa, Roberto answered. You know it's not so. That's not so. Papa glanced at Roberto, lowered his eyes, and asked me to bring him the small silver metal box where he kept our savings. When I brought it, he sat up slightly, opened it, and counted the money inside. If I work in Santa Maria, we might be able to get through this winter with what we've saved, he said worriedly. But what if my back won't let me? Don't worry, Papa, Roberto responded. 
Panchito and I can find work in Santa Maria, thinning lettuce and topping carrots. Seeing this as a chance to persuade my father to leave Corcoran and knowing I was anxious to return to Santa Maria, Mama winked at me and said to Papa, Roberto is right, viejo. Let's leave. Besides, the immigration may come around again. It's safer living in Santa Maria. After a long pause, Papa finally said, You're right. We'll go back to Boniti, Boniti Ranch tomorrow morning. Like swallows returning to Campestrano, we will return to our nest, Bonetti Ranch in Santa Maria, every year after the cotton season was over in Corcoran. The ranch became our temporary home. We had lived there in barracks eight months out of the year from January through August, ever since Tent City, the farm labor camp, had been torn down. The ranch was located on East Main Street, but had no address. Most of the residents were Mexican farm laborers who were American citizens or had immigrant visas like Papa. This made the ranch relatively safe from border patrol raids. I was so excited about going back to Bonita Ranch that I was the first one up the following morning. After we packed our belongings and loaded them into the car, we headed south to Santa Maria. I could hardly contain myself. Roberto and Trumpito were excited too. I imagined this was how kids felt when they talked about going away on vacation. Papa could not drive because of his back pain, so Roberto drove. The trip took about five hours, but it seemed like five days to me. Sitting in the back seat, I opened the window and stuck my head out, looking for road signs saying, Santa Maria, can't you go faster? I asked him patiently, poking Roberto in the back. Sure, if you want us to get a ticket, he responded. That's all we need, Papa said, chuckling. If that happens, we may just as well turn ourselves in to, in to La Migra. I immediately closed the window and sat back without saying a word. After traveling a couple of hours, Mama suggested we stop to have lunch, which she had prepared that morning. I was hungry, but I did not want to waste time. We could eat in the car, I said, hoping my little sisters and brothers would go along with my idea. What about Roberto? He can't eat and drive, Papa responded. We stopped by the side of the road to eat. Papa slowly got out of the car, holding on to Roberto's arm, Roberto's arm and mine. He lay on the ground and stretched his back. I gobbled my two egg and chorizo tacos, making sure Papa was not looking, signaled to Roberto to hurry. Ya pues, Panchito, he said a bit annoyed. I'm almost finished. After lunch, we continued our trip. The closer we got to Santa Maria, the more excited I became because I knew where we were going to live for the next several months. I especially looked forward to seeing some of my classmates in the eighth grade at El Camino Junior High. I had not seen them since last June when school ended. I wonder if they'll remember me, I thought to myself. As we drove by Napomo, the last town before Santa Maria, my heart started pounding. And as soon as I saw the Santa Maria Bridge, which marked the entrance to the city limits, I yelled out, we're here, we're here. Trampita and Torito also began the cheer and woke up Reuben, who had fallen asleep. Mama looked at us and laughed. Se han vuelto locos, Papa said, smiling and gesturing with his hand that we had gone crazy. Once we crossed the cement bridge, which went over a dry riverbed for a quarter of a mile, I stretched my neck and tried to pinpoint the location of Boniti Ranch. I knew it was near where Tent City used to be, about a mile south of the city dump. The highway, which became Broadway, and went right through the center of the town. When we got to Main Street, Roberto turned left and drove east for about 10 miles. Along the way, I kept pointing out places I recognized. Main Street School, Cress, the Five and Dime Store, the Texaco gas station where we got our drinking water, and the hospital where Torito stayed when he got sick. 
when we crossed the Sui Road, which marked the end of the city limits, and the beginning of hundreds of acres of recently planted lettuce and carrots. When we turned onto Boniti Ranch, I noticed nothing had changed from the year before. We were greeted by dozens of stray dogs. Roberto had to slow down the carcachita to a crawl to avoid hitting them and to dodge the deep potholes in the dirt road that circled the front of the barracks. And a few of the dogs belonged to the residents, but most of them had no owners. They slept underneath the dwellings and ate whatever they found in the garbage. But they were never alone. They were plagued by hundreds of bloodthirsty fleas. I felt sorry for them and wondered if the dogs were bothered by the fleas as much as I was when they invaded our bed at night. The barracks were still the same. Mr. Boniti, the owner, continued to ignore them. Looking like victims of a war, the dwellings had large broken windows, parts of the walls missing, and large holes in the roofs. Scattered throughout the ranch were old, rusty pieces of farm machinery. In the middle of the ranch was a large storehouse where Mr. Boniti kept lumber, boxes of nails, and other building supplies that he had planned to use someday. We rented and moved into the same barrack we had lived in the previous year. We covered the gaps between the wall boards with paper, painted the insides, and covered the kitchen floor using paint and pieces of linoleum we found at the city dump. We had electricity, and even though we could not drink the water because it was oily and smelled like sulfur, we used it for bathing. We heated it in a pot on the stove and poured it into a large aluminum container that we used for a bathtub. To get drinking water, we used our five-gallon bottle and filled it at the Texaco gas station downtown. Along the front edge of the barrack, Roberto planted red and pink and white geraniums. Around them, he built a fence and painted it, also using supplies from the city dump. To the right of our house, a few yards away, stood three large empty oil barrels that served as garbage cans for the residents. Mr. Boniti periodically burned the garbage and hauled the remains to the city dump in his truck. Behind our barracks was the outhouse that we shared with two other families. Sometimes on rainy days, the earth underneath would shift and tilt the toilet to one side, making it difficult to balance inside. Mr. Boniti nailed a rope to the side wall inside to give us something to hold on to. A week after we arrived in Santa Maria, we enrolled in school. Roberto started the 10th grade at Santa Maria High School for the first time that year. Trumpita and Torito resumed elementary school at the main school, at the Main Street School. At El, El Camino Junior High, I continued the eighth grade, which I had started in Corcoran the first year in November, after the grape season was over. Reuben and Rora were still too young for school. Mama stayed home to take care of them. Even though this was my first time in the eighth grade in, at El Camino, I did not feel too nervous. I remembered a few of the kids in my class because they had been in my seventh grade class the year before. Some I hardly recognized. They had grown taller, especially the boys. I had stayed the same, four feet, 11 inches. I was one of the smallest kids in the school. I liked my two teachers. I had Mr. Milo for math and science in the mornings and Miss Ellis for English history and social studies in the afternoons. In history, we concentrated on U.S. government and the Constitution. I enjoyed Mr. Milo's class the most because I did better in math than in English. Every Thursday, Mr. Milo gave, Milo gave us a math quiz and the following day, he arranged our desk according to how well we did on the test. The student with the highest score had the honor of sitting in the front seat first row. Sharon Ito, the daughter of the Japanese sharecropper for whom we picked strawberries during the summer, and I alternated taking the first seat, although she sat in it more often than I did. I was glad that we did not have the same seating arrangement for English. As days went by, Papa's back did not get better and neither did his mood. 
Mama Roberto and I took turns massaging him with Vic's vapor rub. When he was not complaining about not being able to work, he lay in bed motionless with an angry look in his eyes. He took a lot of aspirins, ate very little, and hardly slept during the night. During, during the day when he was exhausted, he took short naps. Early one evening when Papa had dozed off, Mama took Roberto and me aside. I don't think your Papa can work in the fields anymore, she said rubbing her hands on her apron. What are we going to do? After a long pause, Roberto answered, I've been thinking about getting a job in town and I'm tired of working in the fields. Yes. A job that is year-round, Mama said. That's a good idea, I said enthusiastically. Then we won't have to move to Fresno again. Maybe Mr. Sims can help me, Roberto said. Who's Mr. Sims? He's the principal at the Main Street School, I answered. Remember, he gave me a green jacket. Trying to help her memory, Roberto added, he also bought me a pair of shoes when he saw mine were worn out. I was in the sixth grade. Ah, si, sí, es muy buena gente, Mama said, finally recalling who he was. Mr. Sims agreed to help Roberto find a part-time job in town. He told my brother he would let him know when, something, when he found something. Meanwhile, Roberto and I continued working, thinning lettuce and topping carrots after school and on Saturdays and Sundays.